startups for the for my old program and people who know me. <laughs> all right. So very cool. Um, yeah, first of all, welcome and thanks for joining uh, everyone who joined. And um, sorry for delaying it um, for one day. Like initially, it was planned to have it yesterday, right? But then, uh, yeah, things got a little um, mixed up with the with the soccer game, I think, and um, we moved to today. So hope everyone is fine with it. Or I mean, everyone who's here is probably fine with it. But uh, hope not too many people had to cancel. All right, um, cool. So yeah, again, thanks to all of you for joining. Um, today, I want to um, tell you a little bit about uh, our experience. Um, and in the beginning, it was probably only my experience, but in the meantime, it's our experience with uh, how to build a startup, um, especially with uh, or with a special focus on Angular, um, which probably most of you know as a, as a UI framework, right, for, for building web applications. And um, yeah, I just want to tell a little bit the story of uh, Caron Sale, which is a uh, startup which is founded by four people. Three of them are actually FAU uh, alumni. So um, yeah, kind of an FAU rooted startup that uh, unfortunately is not in Nuremberg or Erlangen anymore, but in Berlin by now. Um, but I will explain a little bit about that um, um later and uh yeah i just want to give you a quick introduction um starting with uh sorry starting with um myself so I, i'm as i mentioned also an fau alumni uh, i just copy pasted my linkedin um profile page um <laughs> i was super lazy here so uh, feel free to add me on linkedin if you uh, want to know anything or if you're interested in working with us or if you want to connect, um, always happy to connect with with uh, FAU alumni, alumni, especially with uh, people who are currently enrolled in the IIS, um, as well as in the, the Bachelor of Science uh, Information Systems. So uh, yeah, I was also doing my Bachelor of Science uh, together with uh, Michael, who's also in the call today. I don't know if anyone else is in the call from my uh, from the class of 2012. It's actually it's eight years ago. It's quite a while and um, yeah, I, after my bachelor's, I continued with um, the IIS master as well at the FAU. And um, yeah, I actually <laughs> was enrolled until this spring, I think, like, uh, I think I got my, my um, uh, how do you say, like, exmatriculation um, in... They finally kicked you out. They finally kicked me out <laughs> in uh, March, actually. Uh, I'm still able to use my FAU mail address though, due to Corona, they extended it for some reason. Um, but uh, yeah, I kind of was spending a lot of time at the FAU and uh, was having a lot of fun at the FAU. And that's why I still feel very connected with the FAU, um, even though I left then without my master's. So it was actually quite a yeah, hard decision to um, drop out, uh, especially since only I think one exam and um, the master thesis was, was due. But uh, yeah, in the end, um, I made the decision to uh, go for the startup instead of a master's degree. Probably will regret it in a, in a few years, but um, yeah, still can enroll at another university then. Let's see. All right. But uh, yeah, as I mentioned, I um, studied information systems and international information systems and uh, was... most of the time on software engineering, um, either as a working student or as an intern. Um, I was also um, working for, um, for Daimler, for Mercedes-Benz, right? The parent company of Mercedes-Benz. So um, basically that was the first step into an automotive world, right? So I was super interested in, in cars in general. And then when I joined Daimler, I was mostly in R&D, like software engineering, um, as well as uh, real research, right? Or more like uh, research and development, right? So uh, yeah, but that was just the first step to uh, into the automotive world. So maybe cutting right to the chase and um, yeah, explaining a little bit about uh, Car on Sale, which I already mentioned, which is a startup, which is uh, was founded in 2018. Um, by four uh, founders, as I mentioned, I, I was one of them back then. Um, basically, uh, yeah, three of them alumni. Um, the fourth one was actually a former used car trader. So 
uh, no academical background, um, basically a hustler, you could say, right, who was uh, earning his money for more than 10 years, I think, um, as a used car trader and was also working in a big dealership, in a big car dealership. And therefore, he was kind of the, the origin of the idea for current sale. I'm going to explain what current sale exactly does in a, in a minute. Um, and he basically came with the idea uh, to a friend of his and the friend of his knew a friend of mine and the friend of mine knew myself. And then we kind of connected in 2018 and um, decided that we want to uh, yeah, kind of pursue that project. Uh, first of all, it was like a kind of a hobby project. Everyone wanted to do other stuff next to that, right? Um, so uh, for example, my plan was it to finish my master's and then um, continue with a PhD at the Bodendorf chair. But uh, yeah, the project kind of uh, escalated, so to say. And um, in 2019, uh, like in 2018, when we started, um, we yeah, basically had to build up an MVP. We had to build up a product. Um, and uh, since I was the only one in the team that was, uh, or that had a software back engineering background, I was kind of the, yeah, <laughs> the one working the most in the beginning because I had to build up this MVP, right? And I had to think of how to build that MVP. And that should be the topic for, um, for this uh, presentation today. Um, what to consider and also my key learnings in that, um, in that time uh, that I want to share with you, right? So uh, actually just a quick um, summary is still about current sales. So what we're doing, and I'm going to explain the business model a little more in detail. Um, but what we are um, in general is a two-sided marketplace, um, only B2B, right? For used car trading. We actually have over 10,000 registered um, customers, which are only business customers, right? Because we are B2B, so, like there's no room for, for consumers, right? Like normal people, regular people, like uh, including myself, I couldn't register to current sale without having like a registered car business or car trading business. And um, yeah, we're basically connecting um, used car traders. So those are basically like one man companies um, in, in most cases we're connecting them to big car dealerships, right? And actually there are plenty of both in Germany alone um, and even more in Europe and um, uh, in the world, right? So basically this B2B market, which I'm going to explain later, is very, very present in most parts of the world and is working kind of the same in most parts of the world. So the addressable market for this, um, for the company is actually pretty, pretty big. And that's why we also, um, yeah, after we started in uh, end of 2018, um, we really, really ramped up a very cool product and a very cool team in a very short period of time, um, which was mostly due to a big customer that we had uh, actually from Nuremberg, which is Fesa Graf, right? Which is a very, very big uh, dealership group. And um, due to this customer, we actually could launch the product in a very, very successful uh, manner, right? So um, we didn't need like a year to kind of uh, build the product and uh, kind of attract customers, but we already had the customer in the beginning. So um, because of that, and because we had very, very uh, good growth and very, very high growth rates, um, beginning of 2019, we actually could convince um, Creandum, which is a Swede Swedish venture capital firm, um, which also backed uh, Spotify and Klarna, like Klarna, the um, payment uh, platform or payment provider. Um, in their series seed round, so way back in the beginning, right? Spotify started backing in, I think, 2013 or 2014. I don't know exactly. But um, yeah, due to one of our uh, founder colleagues who was really, really good, connect, really well connected in this um, VC space, we actually got an introduction uh, with them and then we could convince them that our business model is super cool. And back then we really had very, very good numbers, which in the meantime are not that good anymore, but um, we could convince them to invest actually quite a large sum in, um, in the company, in the startup in um, 2019 then. At the moment, um, or by May 2020, um, we are 50 employees um, in Berlin, located in Berlin. Um, part of them, mostly call center located in Greece as well. And at the moment, 10 of them working in product development, right? So Fabien, um, one of our engineering interns who's, who's uh, joining today, he is um, part of our product development team, right? And uh, working as a backend engineer there. And um, yeah, we're really, growing still right i mean due to corona we are uh 
slowing down a little bit, but um, we're actually already preparing for uh, to hire even uh, more people, especially in the product development team. Right? Another cool thing which we uh, could achieve in 2019 after Creandum um, joined, as, uh, joined us as an investor is that we could convince um, the former Daimler CEO, um, Dieter Zetsche, to join as a business angel as well, which is actually opening up uh, a whole lot of new opportunities for us because his face is so well known that you can just advertise yourself with him, right? Uh, so you can basically go to a customer, go to a big dealership and tell, tell them, like, even though they have never heard of you, you can just tell them, hey, this guy is a major investor in us, right? And um, yeah, that was a pretty cool thing and was basically the first uh, thing that was actually perceived also in, in, in public a little bit because as a B2B platform, you're just not really, you're just not very present, right? In, in a consumer mind, so to say. All right, enough to, uh, about the company or about the context. Can I end this up with a question? Yeah, sure. How did you manage to get the Dieter <laughs> Uh Actually, I was, when I was working for Daimler um, in the US, uh, his son was my senior manager and I was like uh, super close to him. And then when we raised the investment with Creandum, I was just contacting him and telling him like, hey, uh, we have this cool product and it's related to automotive and it would be, we're looking for business angels, right? So we're having actually multiple business angels or we're looking for multiple business angels. And um, then we got like an, uh, an invite uh, from Dieter Zetsche himself. And then we visited him in Stuttgart and then we pitched him the concept kind of like, salesman sleazy salesman we came to his house and then pitched him the concept actually this the image on the bottom that uh, was um, created back then when we visited him and uh, yeah we could convince him or better tom um, who's the one on to the left of of uh, him um, he's like the guy with the ties to the vc world and is like very very good in pitching stuff and pitching ideas so he's actually the the deal maker in this case but um, yeah was quite a quite an effort though all right um then cutting to uh current sale or what current sale is providing right so um just like a general overview we're actually having uh, quite a lot of products that we're providing but um the core thing or which with what we started is basically the cos marketplace right the current sale marketplace the cos stands for current sale just want to uh um want to show that this is not the only product anymore right because a marketplace is something that is can be rather simple um, to build, but actually we are providing way more services like transportation, logistics. We're actually having our own payment system now, which is based on, on Stripe, um, which actually Fabien is working a lot with. And uh, we're also doing vehicle inspections. Uh, we're also doing um, uh, having a, an engine or like a, like a platform for lead generation for our dealership customers. But uh, yeah, that's nothing you have to remember right now. Um, I just want to explain maybe first of all the business model a little bit um, just as a context for the product development part then as well um, what we are uh, dealing with um, actually we have a very cool video explanation video but it's only available in German so I'm not going to show it but um, whoever wants to to see it I can share the link uh, after the, the presentation it's uh, pretty cool actually um, so maybe I already mentioned that we are basically connecting or our marketplace is connecting big car dealerships with used car traders, right? And big car dealerships are mostly dealerships and dealership groups like standalone companies or autonomous companies that have contracts with the big um, OEMs, right? With the big um, car manufacturers, so to say. So with Daimler, Volkswagen, etc. So for example, Feser Graf, which is very present in the Nuremberg area, um, he's a contracted dealership with Volkswagen, right? So he puts his own name on his uh, dealership, but he's selling Volkswagen cars like Audi, Skoda, etc. And um, there are actually plenty of those contracted dealerships in Germany alone, right? So um, in Germany alone, we're talking about like 9,000 um, dealerships, uh, which is like a crazy amount of dealerships, right? Germany is really, really crazy about cars. And um, this is kind of the, the mar or like this is kind of our supply side, so to say, right? Because we want to have used cars that these dealerships are purchasing from consumers like you and me basically because what you do or what you are usually doing if you buy a new car you trade in your old car to those big dealerships right so you're going to a mercedes dealership you want to buy a new mercedes it, there's a very very high chance like a 70 or 80 percent chance i think 
um, that you already have an old car that you want to trade in, that you don't need anymore because you buy a new car, right? And the thing is, um, like, no one really wonders where those used cars are going, right? So a Mercedes dealership will also trade in uh, an old Ford or an old Volkswagen. Um, so they will buy a Volkswagen, which is then just sitting in their parking lot, but basically uh, they are not selling them or not selling those old cars, even if it's an old Mercedes. A Mercedes dealership is not selling an old Mercedes that is like 10 years old. Um, they're not selling them to consumers, right? Like to regular people like you and me. Instead, they are selling them to used car traders basically in theory everywhere right thing is in practice they are mostly selling them to used car traders right around the corner so that's actually what how the situation was before car on sale came into the game yes better sorry robin ja ich sollte mich stumm schalten wenn ich mit meinen eltern spreche no um, so basically um, the like there was no real market before um, like we introduced a marketplace for those dealerships, right? So what the dealerships did with, with the old cars that they were purchasing from, um, from, the, uh, from consumers was basically they were having WhatsApp groups or even like Excel sheets that they send around by mail um, to like a bunch of used car traders they know mostly personally, right? Thing is that this is not a real market because the used car traders uh, among themselves, they also knew each other and they could basically form a cartel to basically determine the prices for the used cars that they buy from those, uh, from those dealerships, right? Um, and at the same time, the people working at the dealership were also mostly very, very shady. Like we actually encountered stuff which is, you wouldn't believe that this is happening in a, in a business in Germany, right? So there's like so much shady money flowing from uh, buyers to sellers and uh, sometimes even from like sellers to buyers for some reason. Um, however, the dealerships themselves or better the owners of the dealerships and the managers of the dealerships, they have a very big interest in um, uh, actually earning more money with their used cars, right? For basically one very simple reason, which is that selling new cars to, uh, to consumers is a very very bad business so the margins in this business are super super low right still there are many many dealerships doing it why they are doing it is basically two reasons one is the cars they sell the new cars they sell they are basically supply for their repair shops because as soon as something breaks they come to your repair shop so you make money with them in the repair shop and also when selling a new car you usually buy a, per, a used car which the customer or the the consumer people like you and me we usually don't know how much this car is still worth, right? Because the older the car, the higher the mileage of a car, it's harder to determine, the harder it is to, to determine a price for that car. So the dealerships, they most of the time know the price of the car better or can estimate the price better than the consumer selling it to them. So they can actually make, make pretty good margins on those cars. And the dealerships or the owners of the dealerships now see this used car trading as the future for them because in their core business, which is selling new cars to regular people, they don't make a lot of uh, money anymore, right? Um, so that's why this market is super attractive um, to those dealerships, right? And thing is that the used car traders that you can sell those uh, cars to are not only, cannot only be around the corner, but can basically be in all of Europe, right? Um, so since Europe is like one big economy and uh, we, at least most countries have like one single currency, right? It's very easy to sell cars even in, in cross-border businesses, right? And the thing is that, for example, in Poland, cars are way um, like are worth much more than in Germany, right? Especially used cars or basically in any other country. In Germany, used cars are rather, rather cheap. Um, and that's kind of the promise that we give to the dealerships, right? Like mostly German dealerships at the moment, but um, our buyer side, which is the used car traders, um, they are actually already in, um, in Austria, in Poland, in the Czech Republic, in the Netherlands. So we're already internationalizing on that, uh, in that market a lot, um, at least on the buyer side. And kind of our promise is to enable this frictionless um, used car trading between those parties, right? Because before it was not frictionless at all. It was like super prone to shady shit. There was no real um, quality assurance between, uh, there was no real way of um, having transparent payments. Uh, there was basically nothing in place and nothing digital, like not a digitized solution in place, right? 
um, which is in a shady business like used car trading, very, very important. So that's kind of a summary um, what we're doing. So we are the marketplace um, between those parties, right? So we offer the dealerships to list their used cars um, on current sale and we are actively advertising them and then also taking care of the whole after sales process, process which is transportation, which is um, payment facilitation, which will also be insurance uh, and stuff like that, right? So um, we as a marketplace really have the potential to be um, present in all of Europe, right? Because this business is basically the same in all of Europe. And that's kind of our vision, which is to enable this frictionless B2B car trading in Europe. And uh, of course, how we make money is a, um, is a transaction fee, um, as well as additional revenue streams, but that's our core revenue stream, so to say, um, which is a transaction fee per successfully um, transacted car, right? So uh, every car that is sold, sorry, I see that you're writing comments. Should I read them? Should I be aware of them? I think uh, right now it's a conversation about the Slack tone. Okay, sorry. I can... Is it, is it yours? Uh, I think it's mine, yeah. Wait. Sorry about that. It's maybe Fabien. <laughs> All right. You're welcome. Oops. Okay, I will leave it open a little bit, I guess. All right. Um, so basically, yeah, how we make money is um, we are getting a transaction fee per successfully transacted car, right? So as soon as a buyer is buying a car, we get money. We earn money. And um, yeah, so much for the business model. Um, if there are any questions, uh, just feel free to ask now, probably. Then it's easier to understand most of the rest of the presentation, I think. I mean, in the end, you can imagine it as being a... Um, uh, B2B eBay for used cars, right? Because at the core, we are an auctioning marketplace. So um, we are doing auctions to find the best price for a car. And um, yeah, basically what eBay is, right? So no rocket science at this point. All right, then I will just continue um, with a few uh, screenshots of how the product at the moment uh, looks like, right? So this is like the stage that we have now after almost two years um, of development. Um, yeah, which can, there's still a lot of room for improvement, but um, the thing is that, uh, yeah, we basically, the product is already very, very complex and um, we are uh, working on a lot of uh, topics at the moment. Um, also a lot of topics that you cannot really see as a user, right? So um, CRM integration, payment integration, etc. cetera. Um, but still just for you to get an impression, uh, that's like the current state. Um, and uh, there's actually quite some testing behind a lot of that uh, of that user interface. So uh, yeah, this is like what comes out after doing doing some user research and uh, doing a lot of workshops about how to design uh, stuff for used car traders. Right, that's something that uh, yeah I want to mention um, later as well. That it's like uh, super challenging or can be super challenging if your user base is not like the normal user base you would expect on the internet. Right. All right, um, maybe just going back to, um, to 2018 when everything started, so from a, from a product development perspective now. Um, in the beginning, as I said, we were four founders and only one engineer. Two of them were, and um, yeah, that's actually not the best setup. Uh, that was kind of my, my first uh, minor learning, that um, that's not the best setup to build a tech product, right? Because the software engineer will do all the work in the beginning and um, there will be there are still already a lot of uh, there are already three stakeholders so to say in the product which uh, can be quite annoying for the engineer in the beginning um, none of us uh, of us had any experience with entrepreneurship or with founding a company um, we only had the idea right by os which is the the used car trader and we had a single big customer, which was Feser Graf uh, on the horizon, because um, Tekin, one of the other founders, he had a very good, a very good relationship with him, and um, he was very eager to use us as a, or to pilot the product with us together, right? 
the only thing that everyone had um, and still has, right, is that everyone is super driven and determined, um, not, in the, not only in the founders uh, group, but basically everyone in the company. Um, I think Fabian can, can confirm that. And that's a very cool thing about a startup um, that you don't have like this corporate atmosphere where you have the, the impression that basically 20% of the people working in a corporate are doing work for 80% of the, of the people, right? And the rest is basically doing not so much. So uh, that's a very cool thing about, um, about working in a startup. I mean, it's super stressful as well. Um, there are like, uh, yeah, many, many moments where you think, okay, it would be nicer to work in a, in a corporate or more convenient to work in a corporate. But in the end, you grow a lot, you learn a lot. And um, in my opinion, everyone should have had the experience of working um, in a startup. So back then, um, first thing you do, uh, as always, is you try to find a nice name um, and uh, buy the domain for uh, the company you want to uh, you want to start and uh, yeah that was actually the start current sale was I think the result of a 10 minute brainstorming and the domain was still free and that's why we went for that name so we were really not about branding or marketing in the beginning it was just okay find a name 10 minutes done we bought the domain also this was our first logo which uh, I think was created for 50 euros by some freelancing designer which uh, is not really worth the 50 euros I think but um, yeah basically um, that was one of the, the key learnings in product development um, is like for a startup, uh, which is like you shouldn't spend time on a logo, right? It just doesn't make a lot of sense if you don't have anything um, for your product. So building the product should always be priority number one. And a logo can, be, can still be changed even if you have like after two years, after you are in your Series B, right? And Series C and you raise like millions and millions of euros. So first learning here. How to build a product, um, and that's where we are diving a little bit into um, yeah, the, the technical aspects now. So in the beginning, since uh, yeah, we saw that only having, or only, yeah, only having one engineer on the team is uh, not so good for uh, product development, we decided to go with an, with an agency, which turned out to be a very, very bad agency to help us. Um, and I think we invested like 10K euros or so um, to uh, build an MVP, which we could then use to, to iterate, right? And I wanted to work closely with them, but after basically, I think four weeks, I saw that they were not building anything useful and um, we kind of canceled them, but uh, they had a very shitty contract. So in the end, we were paying 10K. Um, so don't use agencies for anything in a, in a startup environment, right? So um, for anything critical, at least. At some point, you can start to outsource stuff to, to agencies, but uh, especially in the beginning, like uh, the bo both BCG guys in the founders team were convinced that um, we could build a first MVP that we could launch with an agency. I tell you, it's just not possible. You don't want to have that, right? I mean, even if it succeeds, you will have a code base or um, in the end, a product that you don't know, you as the founder don't own, right? And, I mean, you own it in a legal sense, but you don't own it in a technical sense. Um, you don't know anything about, um, about the structure, about the code, et cetera. And you are basically forced to work with that agency then over and over again. And that's just not a good idea for, uh, for a tech startup, right? Um, yeah, we still scouted some more agencies then, but um, we uh, yeah, slowly started then to just build everything on our own, right? Like to start the MVP on our own. And um, yeah, that was basically what I, what I decided to do then um, on my own after I think I scouted the 10th agency or so. And I was realizing that this is not going anywhere and just burning money. So I was uh, yeah, kind of always uh, already aware of what the, the challenges are in a tech sense. Um, and uh, yeah, think about how to build your product um, for, for your company is basically you have to look at your business model, right? And one of the first things we could identify for, um, for, uh, for our business model was that it is a very transactional business model, right? So in the end, it's auctions and it's eBay. It's basically an eBay for used cars. So it, it's no rocket science or it wasn't rocket science in the beginning at least, right? In a later stage, you can still apply the most sophisticated data science, the most sophisticated uh, analytics. You can still apply um, anything uh, you, yeah, that you would consider rocket science. But in the beginning, just focus on, on, um, on the core, which in our case was just an auctioning marketplace. So you have a transactional business model. This has several implications on um, uh, how you should build your, your product then, right? 
you realize that it's a very conventional uh, business model. Um, another thing that we kind of saw very early is that the traffic won't reach consumer application level, right? Uh, consumer application level, which means we're not dealing with millions of, of user interactions uh, per minute, right? So um, we're rather in the 10,000th uh, user interactions per minute. We have different challenges then, right? Um, like for example, different from a social network, which is just processing a shitload of data, but does not really have real time uh, requirements. In our case, since we're an auctioning marketplace, we had real time requirements, right? As soon as someone is bidding on an auction, everyone else watching that auction needs to be informed that the bid has changed. It's not the case for your Facebook post, right? If your Facebook post is visible five seconds after you post it or 50 seconds after you post it, no one cares. But those are just things you have to kind of embrace in the very beginning to um, yeah, get a feeling of what that means for technology, right? And I tell you, I didn't know about anything in the beginning, right? I was just trying to think and trying to put as much effort as possible in how a product could look like that is supporting those constraints that were coming from the business model. But I was never building anything production ready uh, before, right? So it was a very, very painful and long learning process. Um, another thing that we uh, planned right from the beginning was that we want to have it mobile, which uh, has kind of the implication. Bobby, to, yeah. could you explain MVP again for everyone? Because I'm not sure if everyone knows what MVP is. Yeah, sorry. So MVP basically man, means a minimum uh, viable product. So basically um, the, the thing, like the, the, <laughs> the smallest part of your product with which you can still not make money, but with which you can still satisfy a customer, so to say, right? So basically, if you think of a product like uh, Facebook, um, you have like this enormous social network, but at the core, what do people want? They want to post pictures, uh, they want to have a news feed, uh, they want to send messages to their friends, right? So this would be kind of, well, like roughly speaking, this could be an MVP for a social network, right? To have these three functionalities, they don't have to look great, they don't have to scale great, right? You don't build that, or you don't have to build those three features for um, a million people in the beginning, but maybe only for a thousand people, right? Because you don't, you won't have this amount of users in a, in a foreseeable time. Um, and an MVP is basically something that is really, so to say, the skateboard, right? That's the first thing you build that has wheels and um, everything after that, everything that comes after that, like in the end, you want to have a car, you want to have a Ferrari, but you start with a skateboard, right? And the skateboard is getting you from A to B, just like the Ferrari. That's kind of the comparison, I think. Makes sense, right? Um, exactly. And um, yeah, another thing, as I mentioned, uh, we wanted to have mobile apps. So uh, this had an implication um, on how we structured front end and back end. Um, we assumed that there will be multiple front ends, right? So front end, basically user interfaces um, to a user. So not only you can access current sale through, uh, through the browser or through the web, but also through uh, iOS, through Android, um, and uh, yeah, basically mobile um, mobile devices and with native apps or through the browser, right? You also have to distinguish that. But um, yeah, that's also something you want to consider as early as possible because uh, especially like a loose coupling between front end and back end, which basically means the front end has not much to do with the back end. So you can add as many front ends as possible or you can adjust the front end as you want without having an impact on your back end where the actual product and business logic is, right? Um, and stuff like that is, this is very basic, everything here, right? Like anyone uh, of you who is aware a little bit of software architecture would say, yeah, that totally makes sense because as I mentioned, it's not rocket science, right? But we're building, we don't have to prepare for uh, the scale of a million uh, user interactions here. So we really try to go with a conventional approach, which has the big advantage of, of Many, many people can help you, right? You, you don't have to have for a specific technology or for a very specific uh, architectural pattern, but you can just uh, rely on many, many other people who already did the same, right? In the end, if it's providing value to a customer, it's fine. Um, yeah, back then, uh, when in 2018, um, after we launched the product, actually, we moved to the Zollhof. So I want to give a quick shout out to the Zollhof as well here. Uh, probably most of you know it. Um, and uh, they provided us with a shared office space, which we used in the beginning to yeah, kind of do everything, right? Like we basically lived in that, uh, in that office for, uh, I think half a year. And uh, it was the very, very early stage when there were no employees at all. Like the guy in the middle is just a visitor here. All right. 
then in June 2018, which was when um, we decided to basically start with building the product, uh, right? So June 2018 was basically when I thought about the business model and all the implications that it could have on technology and on architecture. And then we went right on um, planning everything, right? And planning the, the product architecture or the, the software architecture behind that. And again, this sounds like a... Uh, like like weird computer science terms here, but it's basically, it's a very, very basic architecture pattern, right? So, which is, you have a presentation layer, you have a business logic layer, and you have a persistence layer. Or better, you have a user interface, which is a presentation layer, you have business logic, which is kind of where your business magic is happening, right? Where your actual actual algorithms and whatever whatever else you have is, is running. And persistence is basically, the persistence layer is basically your database layer, right? Or where you store data. And uh, this is like the most common um, architecture ever, <laughs> I would say, uh, or at least in, in, in these times. And we just decided to go for it because we knew that we, as I mentioned, not, are not doing rocket science. And uh, we knew that we are not like requiring what, for example, a Google is requiring. So we just went with this approach and we didn't know at all if it's the right approach, right? Um, I mean, it's a very common approach, but we didn't know, we couldn't guess all the, uh, the implications here. Um, oops. So yeah. So um, yeah, let's basically start with the presentation layer, which is um, the layer where um, Angular comes into play, um, as well as its, so to say, competitor, which is uh, React. Both of them are frameworks for the presentation layer, so to say, um, at least in the web space, right, which is most presentation layers. Um, both of them are UI frameworks, so user interface frameworks. Both of them are based on JavaScript, like basically every front-end framework um, out there. JavaScript ha does not really have an alternative uh, in the web, uh, which is cool, but at the same time also sometimes shitty. And um, yeah, there's actually quite a war going on out there between um, people who like Angular and people who like React. Um, actually, there are way more people from my experience that like React than uh, Angular. And um, yeah, we also kind of face the decision which framework to use, right? Maybe one step back, why do we want or why do you want to use a framework at all for, um, for developing your application, your product um, or any UI basically? Um, you could also go with a vanilla JavaScript approach, which means you're not using anything external. You're just using JavaScript um, as, a, as a language, which is directly runnable in a browser, in a modern browser or in any browser, basically, right? Together with plain HTML, plain CSS, which is like the most low level you can go in the web space. But um, this is only nice for building like very hacky, very, very simple applications and basically nothing that you want to have in a, in a production system and nothing you want to make money with, right? Um, there's another thing which probably most of you know that uh, are familiar with JavaScript, which is jQuery, um, which is kind of an abstraction or like a library on top of JavaScript, which allows actually in the browser to um, perform many, many everyday operations in a way easier manner than JavaScript allows it. And jQuery, in the beginning, when it came out, it was like the way to go to build, um, to build web front ends. But actually, even in the meantime, jQuery is not really used out there anymore for, I would say, like serious applications um, that uh, require some software engineering, right? We're not talking about the one page application where you enter your uh, whatever mail address and you uh, get like, a, or you can convert your PDF um, in, an, in, an, in an online converter, right? So we're not talking about that, but we're talking about really products that are growing where real software engineering is done behind that. And um, frameworks in general, um, just like Angular and, and React, they appear to be quite heavy weighted, right? Or, or heavy weights in a sense of that uh, they, are, they are really, really big, right? To install a framework um, alone, you need a package manager. And a package manager is actually installing a lot of shit on your computer in order to use a framework, right? Because a framework is not only... Um, like jQuery, a library in the in, in most cases, but it's just bringing so many more tools, right? And um, the question for most beginners is why should I use that when I can just use jQuery, for example, to build my web application here, right? And that's a very, very valid question because most beginners don't even need the complexity and the, the features that frameworks provide. But actually, as soon as you plan 
to have a certain complexity in your product, it really makes sense to look at it. And it really makes sense to also look into the concepts, look into the tools and look into the, the, the paradigms behind those concepts that frameworks are delivering, right? Like for example, code conventions. Um, frameworks are usually like Angular, for example, is, um, is uh, bringing some code conventions um, to, your, uh, to your project, which means Angular is telling you how to do certain stuff, how to name certain stuff, how certain code has to look like, right? Which is for a beginner somewhat not intuitive because a beginner thinks, okay, I can name a variable or a class or whatever um, any way I want. But uh, yeah, in software engineering, so as soon as you work with a growing team and as soon as multiple people are working on it, and even if you're working alone on it, it really makes sense to have code conventions just to restrict yourself a little bit um, and don't let complexity explode, right? So it's like, it definitely makes sense to restrict yourself um, a little bit in, in uh, for example, coding style, right? Uh, dependency injection and another thing, um, another like very, very essential thing that um, is also a very old concept, but actually you don't learn, I think, um, what it really means in university, or at least I didn't learn it in, in any course. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, if anyone knows where you, where you really learn what it is, but it's like probably the most basic thing you should know um, as soon as you go into software engineering, right? So this is like a basically, a, I think there's like a saying that it's like a five, 500 euro uh, or 500 dollar term for a five cent principle. Oh, I don't know. I don't know the exact term, but um, if you don't know what dependency injection is, I won't explain it now. This will be too complex, but um, look into it. And a framework can help you to realize that, right? They are bringing you um, dependency injection or most of them are bringing you dependency injection for whatever project you're building. For example, Angular is bringing it for, um, for your JavaScript environment, right? JavaScript itself doesn't support dependency injection, so to say. State management as well. So how do you handle the state, the, the actual um, things you store in your application? Code generation. So as soon as you create, for example, a new sub page in your application, like you don't want to write everything from scratch again and apply all the design and apply all the, the, the functions that you want to use in, in multiple uh, sub pages. You don't want to do that manually, but you want to have a, an automatic tool or tools to automate, automate that for you, right? And frameworks are bringing you that. Also stuff like lazy loading um, and many, many more concepts that you can look into. Um, those are or can be brought um, into your project by just using a framework, right? Um, but obviously those are many, many concepts and they are blowing, really blowing complexity up in, uh, for a framework. And that's why it's perceived as a heavyweight here. Just a quick comparison because I was now talking about frameworks and actually if you um, like take it really, really seriously, React is not really a framework, but also only a library. Um, and Angular in comparison, like those are the two um, technologies, I call it technologies, not frameworks, um, that uh, compete a lot. Um, and only Angular of them is a framework, right? So the second point here, you see framework and library. One of them, Angular, is supported by uh, Google, React supported by Facebook. So this is kind of like the, the framework war. There's actually a third one, which uh, is getting a lot of popularity, which is Vue.js, um, which does not have like a big Silicon Valley player uh, behind it, I think, but is also getting uh, a lot of ground. Um, but in most projects, you will either see Angular or React. Um, then there are some more um, uh, some more differences here, right? Angular is rather heavyweight because it is a framework and uh, React is rather lightweight because it is a li only a library. And uh, one thing that I really learned is that um, React is more popular than Angular. And I assume that it's the case because more people are just starting to work with, like even beginners are starting to work with React. Uh, they see it's super easy to use. It's uh, very lightweight so they can build like an app application right away and Angular, if they just start to use it as a beginner, they will be overwhelmed with the complexity, right? All right, and then one very important thing which I'm uh, going to uh, talk about in a minute is TypeScript and JavaScript. Um, so Angular is actually bringing you not only all these concept, concepts which I, which I talked about, but is also bringing you the language in which you, um, which you have to use then, right? Because uh, usually everything is based on JavaScript, but TypeScript is a very cool um, super language on top of JavaScript, which is very, very cool. I'm going to explain to you uh, about that, uh, I think now, yeah. Um, so yeah, just a few reasons why we went for Angular back then. Um, 
One thing, which was a very pragmatic approach, is that there I already had a solid level of previous experience with Angular, um, even with older versions of Angular, and I was like constantly um, in touch with Angular during the course of my, my software engineering experience. And um, we also could already project that the product complexity was uh, will explode at a rather early stage probably, right? So concepts like dependency injection, code generation, all those conventions that I mentioned, um, they come in very handy if you expect that your project won't be in the end just like a web page and like five sub pages, right? But we assumed that due to the complexity, due to the requirements, um, the enterprise level requirements by our customers, right? It's not consumers that are telling you, hey, I want to have this page, I want to have this page, but um, actual enterprises, enterprise level customers that want to have certain features in the product. And because of that, we expected that complexity could explode. There was also a guess in the beginning and it turned out to be true, but um, it could explode in a, in a very, very early stage of the project. And uh, the third reason why we went for it is just TypeScript. So as I mentioned, TypeScript is a super lang or super set um, of the JavaScript language, which uh, means different stuff. One, or like maybe the first learning um, that, uh, or like the second learning that I had um, when I was deciding between Angular and React is really, you shouldn't fall in love with your technology, right? Like just because you know the most stuff about React, um, you shouldn't automatically consider it for every single project you're doing. So even if I said, okay, I had previous experience in Angular, I was really, really thinking through and even trying out uh, React just to get an impression like how does that behave? How is that um, technology maybe beneficial for what we want to do, right? And the thing is in the end, it's still a guess, especially when you have the experience level that I had back then. Uh, it's still a guess, but try to be pragmatic with everything you do, right? Um, and this learning is actually a little contradict, uh, yeah, it's contradicting a little bit the, the next slide, which um, is very much a love letter to TypeScript, <laughs> um, because that's one technology I would exempt from that rule, uh, from that learning, um, because you should fall in love with TypeScript if you are already a fan of JavaScript. Why should you be that? Or why should you, should you fall in love with TypeScript? Um, one very pragmatic reason is actually that um, every JavaScript code is uh, valid TypeScript code, right? In, in, uh, in the end. So basically, you have a full-blown JavaScript project with 10,000, 100,000 lines of code. You can just install TypeScript and all the JavaScript files, you just rename that from JS to TS, and all of them are valid TypeScript code which sounds counterintuitive because TypeScript should be, sorry, TypeScript should be a, um, or is another language, but still it is a superset language, which means it's in, it includes JavaScript in its own scope. And that makes it very, very easy to migrate code, right? You don't have to do like a very big migration, um, like a big bang migration where you just spend like a month just um, translating JavaScript to TypeScript, but you just can do it incrementally, which is pretty cool, right? Um, this is probably not the case for startups because um, startups, they usually like start from scratch, right? And start from a green field. And in this case, I would always recommend you, as soon as you work with JavaScript, work with TypeScript. That will be the third learning, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, yeah, so this incremental migration is not the, the biggest plus for a startup here. What is though, is really the static typing for JavaScript because that's what TypeScript is all about, right? So the type um, is... Typing is basically the only real thing that TypeScript brings to JavaScript, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it actually brings you so much benefit. Um, yeah, and basically how it works internally is that TypeScript is, you have a TypeScript file and you transpile it to JavaScript. And then in the end, you have a JavaScript file and you can throw it into your browser and it will work as if it's, uh, if it, as if you just written everything in JavaScript uh, yourself, but you're writing it in TypeScript which gives you at the time of the transpilation, like when you translate TypeScript code to JavaScript code, gives you type safety, right? So TypeScript will complain, for example, if you put uh, an, uh, a string data type in a number, sorry, I'm living in Neukölln, there's like a lot of sirens going on here. Um, so yeah, static typing, like very, very much appreciated. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it really is. Um, another cool thing is that you can have one single code base in TypeScript um, and multiple target platforms. Like you can basically translate your TypeScript code to JavaScript that is compatible with Internet Explorer even or um, with some other 
standard of JavaScript that you need in order to support like an old browser. But in the end, you still have one single code base and you just need to configure the transpiling process of TypeScript to um, create JavaScript that is following another standard, right? So that's also super cool. And uh, another thing is that it offers generics. It pretty much looks like Java in the end. I won't show any, any uh, deep code examples here, but um, it pretty much looks and behaves like Java. So if you really like Java, but at the same time, you see the big advantages of JavaScript or of the, the asynchronous, um, um, the, the asynchronous uh, paradigm that JavaScript implements, then TypeScript is really, really for you. So yeah, just quick summary again, why you should use TypeScript uh, instead of JavaScript. Um, even though it's super closely related, uh, I don't recommend anyone to build anything in JavaScript anymore if you have the chance to use TypeScript, right? So um, I, I, by myself, I haven't written JavaScript in uh, I think the last five years or so because every time there's JavaScript, I use TypeScript. Um, and yeah, one, thing that probably if you already have experience with JavaScript um, you will encounter is that JavaScript is like not having this static typing which means you can basically store any value in uh, in a variable right so you can store store a string in a value uh, in a variable um, and then you can override it with a number and then you can override it with an object that you created right and basically everything that can go wrong will go wrong at runtime in JavaScript and that's like super shitty because um, that's not how software engineering should work, right? You don't want to test everything um, or you don't want to run everything that you, that you want to deploy in the end. But you really want to restrict yourself again a little bit by using TypeScript, which is, of course, a pain because you have to apply static typing. You have to specify a type for everything you, uh, you create in terms of variables, uh, classes, etc. But in the end, you profit a lot. The bigger your project gets, the more you profit from that. And that's like a very practical uh, example of like what TypeScript is doing or practical image what TypeScript is doing, right? So basically all those random data types you have in JavaScript and you have like a lot of different weird data types um, because JavaScript is just um, a pile of shit, basically. Um, TypeScript is preventing you from all of the shit that can happen to you, um, which is summed up here, uh, which is basically just... JavaScript in a nutshell. Um, it's just not a language that was invented for um, anything higher than making your, your mouse cursor in, in, the, in the browser blink, right? So, but still somehow it turned out to be like a, like a very cool, um, it turned out to have like very, very cool paradigms behind it that um, people actually really like and therefore people are using it everywhere now, right? Like even on the server side, which we are doing as well. All right, so yeah. Another thing um, related to TypeScript, like uh, this is, this guy probably got it wrong because um, many people see TypeScript uh, not as what it really is, right? Like TypeScript is really, by bringing the static typing is really making JavaScript scalable, which means stuff like refactoring, stuff like, you know, like including renaming of variables, renaming of, of, um, of objects, even renaming of strings. All of that is only possible in a, in a, um, in a reliable way when you use TypeScript. Like your IDE, your, your development environment won't really, um, cannot really handle JavaScript because in the end it's dynamically typed, right? Like if you use WebStorm, for example, as an IDE for, for JavaScript, there's a pretty high chance if you rename a variable with the WebStorm feature, you will rename in the end a string even or whatever, stuff you don't want to rename. And that's like very, very basic stuff that JavaScript does not really support and TypeScript is fixing all of that or most of it at least um, but yeah um, it's like sometimes sadly the case that people just take it or mistake typescript as uh, kind of an auto completion tool because that's also something that um, uh, typescript is allowing you then um, in, in an easy way it's like yeah. type completion okay uh, so yeah in the end typescript is JavaScript that scales. There's also how Microsoft, which is the company behind TypeScript, probably the best Microsoft product ever. Um, that's also how they advertise it, right? So JavaScript that scales in a sense of scale, um, in a sense of scaling with the project size, right? Scaling with, uh, you have like 100,000 lines of code, which we are already exceeding um, by a lot. And you just want to rename whatever class or type or whatever you're using. Um, this 
can be done with one single command here. Some more JavaScript tips. Uh, yeah, just going through that uh, quickly. Um, always use um, the like modern um, JavaScript uh, language standard, which is ECMAScript 6. Uh, use arrow functions, uh, use static code analysis. Um, for example, we are using ESLint. Um, and use WebStorm, which is, in my opinion, really the best IDE out there for anything related to the web, uh, especially JavaScript and like especially TypeScript, right? So we are using it and I don't regret it. Oh, I haven't regretted it uh, any second um, in the last two years. So yeah, key learning three is if you use JavaScript for anything, which you will when you do uh, web development, then use TypeScript instead. Then um, just a quick look on the backend. Um, when we decided to, uh, to go with a backend technology, we uh, actually thought through um, some different languages and frameworks and technologies we, we saw. Um, but in the end, we also went for TypeScript um, or better JavaScript and then TypeScript on top um, because of one cool reason, which is you're really allowing full stack development here, right? So the cool thing is no other language allows it to have or like, not really another language allows it to have the same language on the front end side if you're working on the web um, as you have on the back end side, which really enables people to work on both sides then, right? Full stack developer in a Java back end with a Angular front end is always switching between two languages, right? You're always having like a like a break, so to say, between um, between the front and the back end. So TypeScript also I can recommend it for the back end, but um, yeah, it has some other implications than on the front end side, right? Um, but very cool things you can do, as I mentioned, um, or like one very cool thing that you can do is code sharing. So you can basically uh, really show, uh, share parts of the code between um, the front and the back end. So for example, what we are doing is we're sharing our data models, our data definitions between front and back end, which means, um, yeah, you basically don't have to, to transform anything. You can just use the, um, the same class, the same uh, interface you're using on the backend side as um, on the front end side or vice versa. And uh, that is yeah, another reason why this is like really or like real full stack development in the end, right? And uh, another cool thing is that Node.js, which is JavaScript for the backend, so to say, is a very popular, um, uh, popular technology on the backend side. And it's super easily combined with, with TypeScript because in the end, Node.js is JavaScript and TypeScript so to say, is JavaScript, right? Um, so this is also super easy and you can use a very popular and also scalable technology like Node.js. And then in the end, um, yeah, one of the biggest advantages I would say is that backend and frontend engineers can understand each other in terms of technology, right? Like usually those roles are separated in most companies, it's same for us or same mish for us. Um, but uh, in the end, for example, Fabien, um, you are uh, basically working on both sides, right? And you don't have to, switch in terms of technology. Like you only need to understand one technology and then you can work on both sides. It's also a very, very cool thing about, uh, about TypeScript, using TypeScript. And that's what we, uh, what we went for, right? So we started to use TypeScript on the backend side. And um, one question that probably many startups or many um, yeah, people dealing with architecture are asking themselves is, should we go for microservices? Microservices, I don't want to explain it in detail now, but it's a very popular architectural concept for how to structure your backend, right? And actually it's very popular and I think many, many people want to apply it and use it because it, it sounds very, very cool. And it also sounded cool to me in the beginning, but um, I actually read a lot of, um, of literature about it and a lot of articles and by many, many gurus also from the microservice world. And um, actually going with microservices from the very beginning on is not a very good idea. So uh, there's actually this one um, very, very comprehensive uh, explanation by um, Martin Fowler, which is, oops, which is kind of the godfather of uh, application architecture or enterprise application architecture. And um, he's also saying that microservices, or if you go directly to a microservice architecture, there's like a very, very high risk that you will get something wrong. So in the end, um, what he's recommending is that starting with a monolithic architecture, which is like the, the yeah, I think most of you know like what the term monolith means, right? But it, which is like the, so to say, old way of, of um, building applications or old way to, to structure and 
to structure your application architecture. This is actually the better approach. Even if you want to use microservices in the long run, you can start with the monolith. And as soon as you implement a clean, um, a clean architecture within this monolith, you can then slowly extract um, microservices time by time and reduce the potential or the, reduce the risk of fucking something up on the way there, right? So you can still go back to your monolith um, at, at one point. Of course, this is also has some implications on scalability, but for us, since we said, okay, scalability or at least the high traffic uh, volume um, that, for example, a social network has, we are not expecting that. So we went for a monolith, um, monolithic approach in the beginning. All right. Um, so yeah, if you want to read about that, just uh, I, I will share the slides afterwards so you can you can check them out. Um, that's a little more into um, into architecture, especially backend architecture. But I don't want to talk too much about that. I just want to have um, want to share the key learning that on the backend side, uh, it makes a lot of sense in my opinion um, to start with a monolith, uh, basically always, right? All right. Um, then when it came to hosting, where should you host whatever you build, right? Um, we had a front end and we had a backend or an idea for a front end and a backend, how to build it, which technologies to use. But in the end, um, you need to host it somewhere. So you need to make it available to the public or to your customers. And um, there's actually, I think Michi, you are the expert on that, right? Um, working at Adidas for, um, with like uh, the IT infrastructure. And um, yeah, I think you're probably also working with AWS, which is uh, Amazon Web Services, which probably most of you know. And it really, really is everywhere in terms of uh, infrastructure, right? And hosting, hosting basically anything on the web. So AWS, you can say that basically AWS is the internet. Um, but at the same time, I mean, AWS is a very low level solution which makes it rather cheap, but also quite complicated, right? So um, to use AWS, uh, you need time and you need an understanding of what you're doing. And um, of course you can learn that. And when you learn that and when you're able to, to make use of it and make the most out of it, um, it's very, very powerful, right? Like AWS is basically, you can build anything with it, but at the same time, you shouldn't fall in love with it, right? Don't fall in love with the technology. Um, even if you have experience with AWS, you have to ask yourself the question, okay, um, my product will have a certain complexity, maybe even scalability will be an issue at some point. And you need someone who's understanding AWS, right? So you need people understanding it. And um, those people mostly like what you do in, in uh, like what you do today is you basically go for a DevOps approach where your engineers are also kind of in charge of um, providing their infrastructure and, and managing the infrastructure. And uh, yeah, basically that costs money, right? So for a startup or for a company that you're, that you're starting, you have to kind of uh, compare the costs of getting someone in the, maybe even in the, in the short run, right? To manage your, your infrastructure, to manage your, your AWS. Um, or you just go for maybe one level of abstraction higher, which is not an infrastructure as a service provider, like IaaS, but is a platform as a service provider, right? Um, and there are actually many out there. Some of them are actually based on AWS, but um, are providing a way better abstraction of the infrastructure itself, right? And some of them, I mean, they are pretty uh, well-known names, I think, which is Google App Engine, Microsoft Azure, and for example, Heroku, which belongs to uh, Salesforce, uh, another big Silicon Valley company. And um, those providers make a lot of sense in my opinion um, because in an early stage at least um, and for us also in a, in a medium um, uh, medium stage I would say because they may cost more but at the same time they are allowing you to um, save the the money for an extra uh, DevOps engineer right that you need to hire in order to just manage whatever you're building there and actually we went through all of them in the beginning and we checked all of them. And um, in the end, we, did, we went for Heroku as a, as a solution, which is probably the most unknown of those three here. Um, and we compared it to AWS and actually it is five times more expensive than AWS per hour. But uh, as I already said, um, AWS is not very expensive. So it's, it's rather cheap. So this five, this multiple of five here, um, you have to uh, consider that this paying this multiple of five is saving you in the end a 
someone who's dealing with the AWS infrastructure, right? Because the abstraction that Heroku is providing of this complex infrastructure, like, okay, you need orchestration of your, your server nodes um, that, you're, that you're firing up. You need a load balancer in front. You need to have your migration uh, process uh, in place. Like all of that, Heroku is taking care of that, right? And in the end, I think right now we're paying like 1,200 euros or so for all of our Heroku services. And we're actually having quite a lot of Heroku services. And in the end, that's still cheaper than someone that to hire someone, right? To uh, basically... Um, deal with the infrastructure 24 seven, right? And uh, every time you need it. I mean, of course, the uh, DevOps engineer can then also develop hopefully, but um, at the same time, it's, it's just, especially in the beginning. And if you don't deal with, um, if you don't have like very complex requirements to, for your infrastructure, then really look into those platform as a service providers as well. One other cool thing is that, and I think that's maybe true for AWS as well, but it's very, very easily integrated, um, integratable with um, any CICD um, provider, like continuous integration, continuous delivery provider uh, out there, as well as with, as with GitHub, which is our um, version control system that we're using, right, to host our source code. And it's super easy, right? Like you don't need a lot. It's basically one click, uh, one click integration here. And uh, you are also saving a lot of effort, which you can then spend on actually building the product and delivering value um, or providing value instead of just dealing with all this uh, infrastructure shit, which may have some value or may provide some value in the long run when scalability becomes an issue. But in the short run, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to spend your valuable time on, on, uh, on those infrastructure topics. Bobby, one yep. question. Mm -hmm. um, when did you make these decisions for Heroku? Uh, during the MVP process or after, afterwards or before? Uh, do you, like basically before the, the MVP process, right? I mean, to build your MVP, you still need like some place to host your MVP. And actually, that's also where Heroku is pretty cool because you can um, use it for free with, a certain, uh, with certain restrictions, right? And you can just build your MVP basically for free there. And we did that in the beginning. And then we just looked into um, all those criteria here. Um, before we said, okay, now we want to have it hosted professionally, so to say, and we were already on Heroku for the test phase or for the MVP phase. And then we evaluated all of that. And then we went, um, we went with Heroku in the beginning. Okay. But this is a decision you might want to um, make quite early, right? Because you want to have your infrastructure in place. And then even if like you don't have an MVP yet, or you're building up your MVP, you want to um, maybe send your customer a link, right, to your product and tell them like, okay, what do you think? Like iterate fast over the product and uh, therefore you need some space to host it, right? I mean, you can also use your Raspberry Pi in the beginning that you, that you have at home. But um, since Heroku is free, it just makes sense to use it in the beginning and then you can evaluate more on that. Okay, and you're still now on Heroku. Exactly. Yeah. In 2020, okay. Exactly. I think we... Yeah, we're having an, an enterprise level contract now. So we have enterprise level support. Um, we're paying now, as I mentioned, like around 1200 um, um, euros per month, which sounds a lot, right? And probably with Amazon, it, the, the, costing, the cost for the hosting alone would be way lower. But um, yeah, we just didn't need anyone yet to care about the infrastructure, right? I mean, Fabien, actually best example today. Um, thanks for joining. Um, you are already very, very proficient with, with Heroku, right? And it took you like, I don't know, um, two weeks or so to get familiar with it. And then there's basically no, um, no complexity anymore in, in doing most of the stuff that you want to do. So, yeah, I can really recommend Heroku at this point. But um, I mean, if you want to work, for example, with more Google products, then maybe a Google App Engine will be will be a better choice, even though it's, I think, more expensive than Heroku, but um, you have better integration with all the Google APIs, right? Which there are a lot. All right, moving on. Um, kind of an overview over the tech stack that we had in the beginning and still are having for the most part. So as I mentioned, uh, Angular, uh, specifically the version seven, um, we are having on the front end side, uh, Node.js, JavaScript, and Express, which is a framework. Uh, never mind about that. Um, we're also using a dependency injection on the on the backend with Inversify JS, uh, SQLize as an object relational mapping system, um, which is kind of abstracting our uh, database system, which is a quite a conventional SQL database. So. Um, many people or many of you maybe wonder why um, 
we went with a with a SQL database um, when we're already in a JavaScript world here. And most of the JavaScript applications I know at least, or, or people know, they also use JavaScript uh, like databases or object oriented or document oriented databases like MongoDB. But our primary database is actually an SQL database. And it's like back to the don't fall in love with your technology, right? So you, just because it makes sense from a technological standpoint to now use MongoDB, for example, as the primary database or anything that integrates very nicely with JavaScript doesn't mean it makes a lot of sense for your product, right? And in our case, why we went for an SQL database, which is actually quite a pain to integrate with JavaScript, but why we went for that is because at the core, as I mentioned, we are a transactional business model, right? And transactions are um, by default supported with, from a transactional uh, or from a relational database system like SQL, right? So we don't have to deal with any distributed transactions, any um, very low level transaction functionalities like you have to do in MongoDB, right? We're still using MongoDB for some specific cases, but the primary database is Postgres. Yeah, we're hosting everything on Heroku and uh, yeah, we're using, I would say, rather common um, systems around uh, all of that. So GitHub for version control, um, uh, for, for source control. Um, we're using Travis CI, which is a um, continuous integration um, as a service provider. Also pretty cool if you uh, know what it is and if you're looking for a CI provider, if you know what CI and CICD is, um, then definitely makes sense to check it out. It also has a free, tier version that you can use for basically building up your build pipeline for your very uh, first MVP, right? So it's a cool thing about those, those subscription services. Um, also GitHub, right? GitHub you can basically use for free, I think, anyway, um, in the meantime with, with professional accounts. Um, and Travis also, like they really support, like those companies really support startups with um, letting you build your MVP basically for free in the beginning. Um, also Confluence and Jira. I think people or like you guys working um, probably in, in um, bigger companies and corporate companies, uh, Confluence and Jira is pretty common, I think, especially in software companies. Confluence is basically um, a, a wiki system or documentation system and Jira is basically a ticketing system, um, especially for agile teams. So we're working with uh, Scrum uh, at Current Sale and we are um, yeah, very happy with those tools actually. But in the beginning, we uh, actually started with Trello um, and we really maxed out the Trello capabilities. Like uh, Trello is really my favorite tool. <laughs> I think we used it till um, I think almost end of 2019 and uh, we managed like a team of six people um, uh, only with Trello, which is also for free, right? So that's pretty cool. Basically everything here is in the, uh, at least in the early stage for free. All right. Um, yeah. If you have any questions, just ask or uh, ask uh, at the end. It's not too long anymore. Sorry for running a little longer. All right. So after we kind of decided to go for, um, or we, we kind of defined the scope or the tech stack that we wanted to use, um, we, it's just starting to execute, right? So as soon as you made a decision, there's no time to rethink that decision really as soon as you started right as a startup because every fucking minute counts and um basically that's uh the stats uh from 2018 like july 29th when i did the first push to the to the repository and um in the meantime uh, i think that was my account on the front end like the those are two repositories on github right the left side is the front end right side is the the back end and uh, in the meantime, it was like 215,000 lines of code added um, on the front end only with my account. <laughs> so actually there's like a bunch of accounts down here that are also adding stuff, um, of course. Um, I'm still the, <laughs> the um, profile with the most contributions, but just because I'm working on it for so long, um, hopefully soon taken over by, uh, by, the, by some other developer. Um, but as you can see, it's like a crazy amount of work and time that goes into that right so as soon as you just want to um uh, want to provide sorry want to provide um uh, an mvp there's no like no reason for delay right you just work through nights i think there was like weeks where i just worked like 16 hours a day from monday to sunday uh, through that right so this was probably uh this phase in the beginning um and um yeah it's just crazy how much 
I mean, I didn't have a master's degree, right? And I had some experience in software engineering, but um, it's crazy how much you learn just by diving right into it and having this passion on the one hand and also this pressure on the other hand that you have to deliver an MVP, right? Especially when you already have a customer inside. You just have to deliver and you learn and grow so much um, when doing that. But uh, yeah, this just requires you to work your ass off. Like this is still what we were doing um, 24 seven basically. Like, uh, I mean, there was no day of vacation yet um, for any of the founders since, uh, since two years. And also uh, all of our engineers, all of our um, product developers, like product managers, they are really, really working their ass off. And that doesn't sound like cool in the beginning, right? But if you do it with passion and if you do it in a, in a cool team, then this is like the best thing that you can do with your early professional career, I would say, right? Because you learn a freaking lot. I hope, Fabian, you can confirm that. All right. And then fast forward after um, a lot of work and um, I mean, this is not a final uh, step then, but um, you just start to launch and don't laugh, but this is like the first, uh, <laughs> the first or screenshots or at least pictures of the first um, product iterations that we had. So everything really, really basic. We went with a very, uh, yeah, annoying yellow in the beginning. I think it, in the meantime, it's a, a little, a little calmer, a little uh, nicer to, to look at. But um, in the beginning, it's just about providing functionality, right? Like also what I mentioned, like you don't, you should not focus on a, um, on a logo that you're, that you're designing. It's like nobody cares about that, except for if you want to build like the new TikTok or something like that, right? It also depends on the business model and on the market a little bit. But in this B2B space, and I would say in most other business models, it just doesn't count, right? Just go for it, provide functionality and provide the functionality that provides value here. And this is like, uh, yeah, I think was like right after the launch, right? And then we had like a first car here and there's like a super shitty view where you could see the car, but then you had to unfold like this detail view here where you can see like the vehicle details, et cetera. It was terrible, but it worked in the beginning, right? And uh, of course you have to improve that over time, but um, in the beginning, it's just about nailing this product market fit, right? So your product has to have at least a little traction with the market. And from then on, you can start building on that, right? As soon as the first money comes in, as soon as you see that your product is working for, let's say, one or two customers in the market, then you can start using that money, reinvest it, and um, just double down on, on um, the stuff you're building. All right. Um, one more thing, um, which is super interesting for, um, in our case, um, which I already mentioned, is that... Um, we are having quite interesting user demographics. Um, so basically we can separate our users or customers in demand and supply side, right? So supply side are the big dealerships, demand side are the used car traders. And it's pretty funny because you have to consider that um, for every single business model you're having, right? Like um, our demand side, for example, only has German as a second language, right? But what are you going to do? Like they don't even speak English in most cases. German is really the common common ground here, but they don't do it very well, right? So you have to uh, come up with texts in the beginning that are super simple to read. Um, they also have a variety of different cultural backgrounds, so uh, it's really hard to think um, yourself, especially when you're like a uh, white German software engineer student who's like uh, 23 years old to think in a way that to build a UI, for example, um, in a in a meaningful or intuitive way, right? For people that are also way older than you, than you are yourself, right? So we're talking about an average of about 40 years in this, on this demand side and also similar on the supply side. So this is like very, very challenging. Um, and those people are also used to face-to-face -face business, right? They don't have a lot of IT affinity or, or web affinity. And you need to build a product that is basically still usable for those um, for this user group here same on the supply side um, we have people mostly speaking german um, and rather bad english so german is the way to go so that's why we didn't start with a german um, page in the beginning or german language in the beginning uh, english language sorry in the beginning but german um, they also have little it affinity they are used to the face-to-face -face business and um, funny thing is that we were in the beginning basically building software for people, for users that didn't want to use us. They were searching for every single flaw, every single bug, every single thing that could, they could complain about. 
um, because our users are actually the people that used to be very corrupt and intransparent, right? But their bosses or their managers told them to, hey, we now use car on sale. You now have to, um, uh, you now have to use this platform to sell your cars, right? And they are basically looking for any issue that they can find and they will complain as loud as they can about it, which makes it especially uh, hard for a developer because you cannot just launch stuff that is broken and um, then risk to lose a customer, right? Because all of the employees of that customer are starting to complain and starting to having real, a real reason to complain about your platform. So that was especially challenging and that's just something I, I um, yeah, wanted, to, uh, wanted to mention here. And um, what I want to say with that is basically that you have to, as soon as you have your MVP ready and you launch it, as I say, as soon as you see the, the smallest traction um, between product and market, you have to reiterate, you have to go out to your customers, um, like you have to talk to everyone, you have to see how they use it, and you have to just get feedback, right? You have to get customer feedback, and you have to iterate on that customer feedback fast. It's like actually a very, very, um, very, very satisfying to your customers, even if they're not super happy with the experience they had, if they see that you provide a feature that they request or something that they report that is not working, they provide a feature and you build it and show it to them in like a matter of days or even hours in the beginning of our platform. Um, they love it, right? And they really get attached to the product and they see, okay, this is a living thing. And that's what like most software these days is, right? It's not like one single code base that you just deploy somewhere um, or build and then deploy somewhere and then it's working, but it's a constant, um, constantly living thing that you're building. And uh, yeah, that's why it's like so important to um, really enable software engineering here as well, right? Because software engineering allows you to deploy um, with confidence. So you have a lot of QA mechanisms, uh, hopefully, uh, a lot of tests. Um, you also have a lot of code reviews at, at some point, but the reason why you, um, why you have that is because you put a lot of thought into how to um, build your product in the beginning and how to build the infrastructure, how to build the deployment process, which frameworks you use, et cetera. Those are all decisions that you make in the very beginning, right? So you don't really need that in the beginning. You just want to have an MVP in the beginning, but then as soon as you have the MVP ready and you want to iterate over it, all those things which you invested in in the beginning, um, using a framework like Angular, for example, right? Um, they pay off a lot, a shitload. Like that's the best investment you can make in the beginning. You can burn as much money as you want. Um, doesn't matter, like as long as you have that um, that ready for for later scale. So yeah, um, sorry. So yeah, again, uh, quickly the key learnings: um, don't spend time on a logo. Just build the product. Don't be in love with your technology. Just be pragmatic. Um, then the statement that is contradicting uh, the key learning number two a little bit um, because I'm a little bit in love with TypeScript, but I just can recommend it because it totally makes sense from a pragmatic standpoint. If you use JavaScript, use TypeScript. Always start with a monolith, work your ass off and get customer feedback, iterate fast, right? Those are like, I would say, at least some of the key learnings from a technical perspective um, that I had during the time and are still like, I can confirm those learnings, right? Every day, basically. Um, yeah, that's basically what I want to share with you here. And uh, yeah, just want to close with some uh, shots of car on sale in the meantime. So um, on the inside, on the left side, uh, we really look like a Berlin startup, right? Um, and uh, we actually managed to look professional on the outside because not uh, everything is working always as flawlessly as we present it to the customer, right? But you still have to make a professional impression to your to your customers. So we're also present at, uh, at fairs and exhibitions and um, in the background, especially the product development team, right? we are really working in a, in a very, very uh, yeah, nice atmosphere. It's not corporate at all, right? We're super dynamic. We are super hardworking. We're super passionate. Everyone is contributing um, and really enabling this, um, this vision we're having, right? Which is the, the frictionless B2B car trading. All right. Then that's it so far. Um, just if you're interested uh, in anything that I just mentioned, um, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we actually have a uh, career page, career.carnsale.de, um, and we're hiring for basically all the positions, even during Corona times. Even though it's a little, it slowed down a little, or at least our hiring process slowed down a little. 
So if you're still looking for internships or full-time positions even during those, uh, those challenging times, um, feel free to reach out. We're looking basically for yeah, everything from software engineering, uh, product related stuff, management design to business development. So even if you don't have the technical knowledge, um, but you still want to experience what it, what it means to work in a startup, right? You can uh, feel free to apply, right? All right. Any questions or, uh, yeah, I originally wanted to have a discussion. I don't know how we are like with the time, Max. Is that like, I mean, the, I would say it's open end. We never set a time limit. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking, but I, I wanted to go for the university scope with like uh, 90 minutes. Yeah. I noticed, I noticed when you said we're, we're short like over time. <laughs> I mean, we started 10 minutes late, so it's, yeah. it's fine. Yeah, so it's, but but university does too. <laughs> okay, for, first of all, th thank you very much for your talk. Um, it was a pleasure. I hope it was targeting like the the audience a little bit. I don't know. It, it, as I already mentioned at the beginning, it's like super hard to uh, build a presentation when you don't know who's attending and you don't know how deep you should go into into stuff. So yeah. that's why I didn't go um, cold or anything, but uh, to Talk a little Marvin, bit. there's a question. Yeah, yeah but I think um, how exactly do you make money? <laughs> uh, <laughs> as I mentioned, we have multiple revenue streams, right? But in the beginning, or how our MVP made money was um, for every successful auction, right? So we can maybe go back a little. Do, 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 do. So basically, all the cars that are listed on our platform are sold through auctions, right? Which means. Um, the seller is listing the car and then we actively advertise, sorry, we actively advertise the, the car to potential buyers, right? So we also have the intelligence of, okay, which buyer could be, um, could be interested in that car. And um, we're having a call center uh, in Greece. We're also having um, some, some um, or a smaller call center in Berlin here. And uh, we're really advertising the car and we're pushing the car to a certain price, right? Which is like the minimum required ask, so to say. And as soon as that price is reached, the car is sold. Even if there's like more money bid on the car, the car is sold from there on. And as soon as the car is sold, we get a um, percentage. In the beginning, it was a percentage. In the meantime, it's like a bucket system of the price that we sold the, sold the car for um, as a transaction fee for us, right? And... Um, that's basically how we make money, right? So we are interested in, in selling as many cars as possible because we earn money with every single car we're selling. And in the meantime, since like that was the beginning and that's how we actually made a lot of money in the beginning with the, with the core marketplace. But then in the meantime, we also started providing additional services, right? So we started providing transportation services, for example. We also started to sell access to current sale in a subscription manner to our sellers. So the buyers are paying nothing, but the sellers in order to list cars, which they were allowed to do in the beginning for free because we just needed customers. In the meantime, they pay like, I think 99 euros per month um, just for having access to car and sale, right? Per user that is, can list cars on our platform. So uh, it's actually quite a diversified um, revenue model at the moment or revenue stream. Maybe to build up on that question um, or to, to expand on it. Um, how is it going with the financials? <laughs> Are you already profitable? No, like, as a, I mean, the funny thing is in the beginning, we were profitable, right? Like when we started and we had like this big customer um, and we were only like six people, basically us and two or three interns. Uh, we basically had no costs, right? We didn't pay ourselves. Um, we only paid the interns. We paid a little bit to Heroku. Um, that was it, right? So it was super easy to be profitable, especially with this big customer, which um, at one point in time, I think sold, uh, I think 500 or over 500 cars in a month uh, in one of the first months through us, right? And that's back then when we took, uh, I think like a 2.7% margin on those cars. So it was crazy, a crazy amount of money that we made in the beginning without having any costs. But the thing is that in order to grow, you really need to double down on that, right? So you really need to um, hire people for certain stuff. As soon as you hire people, you need to hire HR, you need to hire um, 
just you don't want to be the single point of failure as a founder here, right? And you don't want to work until you die. So that's why you have to hire people at some point. And actually, even though we were very successful in the beginning and we were making a lot of money in the beginning, it turned out that our big customer, in this case, FESA, um, they uh, kind of decided at one point to just um, create their own platform, right? Which is like a shock moment as a startup when you realize that you are kind of, that you can copy your model, right? And then actually one of our biggest customer copied our model. So we at the same time lost our biggest customer. And um, the revenues, which were like super high at that time, just dropped by like 90% or over 90%. And then we realized, okay, um, we cannot always do it like that. We cannot always have like one single customer, which is then having negotiation power over us, but we really have to go for a diversified field of customers, right? But in order to do that, you cannot, um, like, cannot just walk to a customer and say, hey, work with us. We are your exclusive uh, provider, but you have to go to a lot of customers, right? So you have to build a sales team. You have to build field sales, which are out there at the dealership selling your product. You have to hire the people in the call center, which are actively selling the cars then. So um, by then we realized, okay, we need money. We need external money. We need money by, um, by venture capital firms because they are giving you the most money, right? Um, with the highest risk associated to it for them, right? I mean, it's super risky to give us money and we actually raised a lot of money, um, but it's super, a super high risk for them to lose all that money, right? Because in the end, we were a startup with like, I think by then, uh, eight people or so. And we didn't have any assets, any securities, right? We don't own any cars. We don't own any, any real estate. We have nothing except for, in the beginning, it was a MacBook, right? Where we basically built the whole MVP. Um, but as soon as you get the money from, from a VC, you have a lot of money, but they expect you to spend that money, right? And they really expect you to burn that money. They expect you to basically grow your revenues, um, grow your um, merchandise volume, so the amount of cars you sell or the, the value of cars you sell, but they don't expect you to be profitable. They basically expect you to just grow in revenue over and over um, as much as it costs and to burn more and more money per month. It's a very crazy system if you think about it, but um, that's actually how basically every startup works that is taking um, VC money, right? Like venture capital money from, from those professional investors. Like for example, Flixbus also, like they are still burning, I think almost, uh, not in Corona times, even in normal times, they are still burning like, I think almost a hundred million per year, right? hundred million euros per year, just to like let their buses drive, right? <laughs> And um, they already have a very high market share in Germany. So they cannot really get profitable in Germany alone. Um, so they have to expand to other countries, right? So they expand to, um, to Turkey, for example. They expand to Russia. They expand to the US because they just have to make those economies of scale work at some point. And uh, yeah, there's actually a big question mark still if Flixbus can ever achieve that, right? But at this point, they are already a company with like 1,200 or maybe after Corona it will be less, but 1,200 uh, employees, which is uh, quite uh, big, right? If you consider that, for example, Dativ has like 7,000 employees <laughs> and it's also green. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting comparison. Okay, there's another question. Um, could you give some examples for, of buyers and do they own business like car repairing shops and what else? Um, like an example for a buyer, like how? Uh, yes, for an example for a buyer. Hmm? Do they uh, own business like car repairing shops, or are they sellers? Um, sellers? So, so basically, the the um, the seller side, like we have this supply and demand side, right? Or demand is the buyer side, supply is the seller side. Um, the buyer side is mostly like very very small businesses, like people working alone, or I would say at least with like one or two employees, um, mostly not focused on any, on any brand. They don't have any contracts with the big car manufacturers because they are way too small, right? It's like the typical used car trader that you see on every corner, for example, in um, close to where FESA is in Nuremberg, right? You have like this big dealership, FESA, which is a seller. But then at the same time, you have like all of those small used car traders around them because they are used to getting the cars from the big dealerships. And those used car traders, this is like a typical, those are the typical buyers on our platform. Um, and on the seller side, it is mostly those contracted dealerships, like, right? Like mostly those very big, very shiny, very um, like big in the sense of they have big buildings, but also they are like big companies, right? Like 
think Feser has like 44 locations in Germany alone, right? Like leadership locations in Germany and over, I think also like around a thousand, thousand one hundred employees or so. Um, so those are like both are businesses or both are kind of enterprise level customers, but they couldn't be more different, right? <laughs> um, which makes it even harder to build in the end a product um, and also a UI that is compelling and comprehensive to both and also satisfying to both. Was that the question? Like um, what, what the sellers, uh, how the buyers look? Um, we can wait for now. Yes. yes. <laughs> the yes, camera, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, maybe I didn't get it right. Okay, uh, let's go for the next question, I think. Um, what's your experience? Uh, how do car dealerships grow their business? For example, Fisa or Kraft? And is current sale enabling dealerships to grow even more? Like, to, uh, for example, to cut costs? Mm. And uh, another question is, uh, why do you think they like current sales? Um, so the, the first question, like, I mean, dealerships in Germany are not really growing anymore, right? Not growing organically, at least. The only way they can grow is basically by acquiring other dealerships in most cases. Um, and uh, that's, for example, what FESA is doing, right? Like FESA started off as like, I think a very small Volkswagen um, dealership here in, in Germany. And then um, by making like very, very good deals, he basically acquired all the different um, uh, competitors of him, right? Like for example, FESA Graf, that's like the brand name, right? But FESA was initially acquiring Graf, which was Autohaus Graf, right? Then you have FESA Breitschwert, uh, FESA, um, Johannes, you have like different, different FESA branches, so to say, but they all belong to the same dealership group in, in the end. Um, and that's actually uh, an issue for us, right? Because there's only a very limited set of customers. I mean, it's rather, it's very big in Germany, but still it's limited, right? You don't have a lot of movement in that market. So if you, for example, fuck up with one big customer and this big customer, which can be like a top 10 dealership in Germany, they know other dealerships, they will shit talk about you, right? And you can, by just burning one customer, you can actually burn many, many more customers um, because everyone is so interconnected in, in this market. And this is also a, a special uh, challenge in, in, for us as a company and, and especially in the automotive market. And we, as Karen say, we cannot really provide dealerships with growing, I think, but we can um, prevent them from dying. <laughs> Because as I mentioned, um, they have three ways of making money, right? That's, which is selling new cars to regular people, repairing cars or having repair shops, like contracted repair shops, um, and selling used cars that they buy from, from consumers. The first, um, the first source of money is selling new cars, which is basically uh, debt in Germany, right? Uh, if you consider that like um, a car, a normal new car that you buy is like 30, 40,000 euros, um, then especially now after Corona, the margins on those cars will be super, super low, right? We're talking about a margin between like one and 2% on those cars. And you have to think that they have to finance or that they have to um, support their big real estate that they are having, right? They're having these shiny dealerships. They are getting very, um, very tough requirements of how the dealership has to look like by the, the manufacturer, right? Because they are giving them um, the, the, the requirements, how it has to look like from a branding perspective, etc. So it's super expensive to run this place. So the first point, selling new cars is basically dead, right? The second part, repair shops, is still making the most money for them. But the thing is, as soon as it switches more and more to, uh, to EVs, to e-mobility, right, to electric vehicles, um, you will have less and less repairs as well because those cars are just less prone to, to, to repairs, right? The only thing that can really break or the thing that breaks the most is eventually the battery. Um, and still, that is like, you rather buy a new car after that, right? After, after your battery breaks or you just let it, re let, like um, you um, get a replacement for it, right? But still, it doesn't, electric cars do not have the same... Um, maintenance uh, requirements as a combustion engine car, right? So these revenues will also go down. So many, many dealerships see in order to survive the only um, pillar that they are having left, which is the used car trading, right? And since this used car trading is like so intransparent for most um, dealerships, we actually are um, kind of the savior in this, in this market because we can then just provide for 99 euros per, per user account 
um, can they provide with a way to um, advertise and sell their cars basically all over Europe, right? And we are even taking um, taking responsibility of the payment, or transportation, etc. So they don't have to worry about anything, right? That's kind of the vision, this frictionless B2B trading, which means there's, there shouldn't be any friction in the sense of in transparency or inconvenience due to um, in an after sales process or even during during the auction that buyers are calling you and asking for, hey, can you sell me the, the car outside of the auction, etc. Like all of that we want to prevent, right? And we want to provide the dealerships basically with a way to squeeze out um, and to really max out the, the margins that they can make in this used car market because that's what's keeping them alive um, for way longer than everything else. Okay. Is the second question, sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, the second question? No, uh, that, that was the whole answer, I think. Pro okay. Yeah, yeah it was the whole answer for the whole questions. Um, there's another question. Um, there are how did the hiring process of uh, changes? through the different stages and how do you motivate your uh, employees so that they can work for your vision? Motivation, maybe Fabien can, can say a few words. No, uh, I, can, I can do that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, just from my perspective, right? Um, the hiring process is actually interesting. I mean, I can only talk or mostly talk for the product development teams. Um, in the beginning, we were working a lot with freelancers because no one is joining you, right? If it's not a founder in the beginning. If you just don't have money and not a working, not a really working product or really um, something substantial that people can identify with as well. No one will join you as a full-time employee in the beginning, but everyone will just join you as a, um, as a, a freelancer, so to say. Um, so they are not bound to the company uh, that much. Um, and they are also super expensive, right? I mean, you uh, can hire a lot of them in a short period of time and you can also fire them again if they are not good, which is, the privilege of a freelancer, so to say. Um, but uh, yeah, in the beginning, it was mostly freelancers. And then we slowly, as soon as we got the money from the investors, as soon as we, um, yeah, basically were taken more seriously in the market, we could then really reach out and use uh, more professional channels. We could do really um, targeted hiring, right? We used LinkedIn, for example, as a direct sourcing platform, which still is the best platform to, I think, uh, reach out to um, to the best talents in the market um, and but all of that costs money right so you need money in the beginning to professionalize so to say your your um, your hiring process and your recruiting um, activities but uh, yeah that then I mean it changes to full-time employees we're still working with uh, I think two freelancers but both of them we want to uh, hire as full time uh, full-time employees now because yeah, in Germany with freelancers, it's not always easy. Like the bigger the, the you get as a company, the higher the risk that uh, at some point someone will check on your freelancers and um, will just, uh, yeah, there's always potential to have legal issues with when working with freelancers, right? Because you're not allowed to, to do, to, to say them what they should do um, directly. You always have to go through like a, like an indirection and you, it's like a weird thing in Germany. So you actually don't want to deal with freelancers the whole time, only in the beginning. But that's kind of how it changed. And um, at the same time, we also professionalized our, the, the process of recruiting uh, itself, right? In the beginning, I was just doing interviews with freelancers and just trying to estimate, okay, how much do they understand from the technology we're using? How much do they understand, uh, like, in general, <laughs> about anything? How well do they speak English? It was mostly remote freelancers, right? Like, uh, in actually, one in the US, we had one in, in uh, Romania, we had one in Bulgaria, we had one in Brazil. Um, and um, yeah, in the beginning it was just chatting and then we came up with a coding challenge at some point. We now have a multi-stage interview process, which means uh, we're having three calls, we're having the coding challenge in between, we're having a cultural fit assessment, um, a technical assessment, uh, and also we want to know whether a candidate can understand the business a little bit at least, right? It's always a plus if you have some effect, like some affinity to um, to the automotive market and some knowledge of the automotive market because in the end, what you see here, for example, all those technical details, all those technologies here, in the end, an engineer has to build it, right? So an engineer, it makes a lot of sense that an engineer is also understanding it. What, what for example, the, the Laufleistung means here, right? The mileage means or the date of first registration, what that semantically means or for the business means.
Um, yeah, and then regarding motivation, um, I mean, as a startup, the thing is you can never pay as much as a corporate, right? I mean, you could, but then you just could not really grow, right? Um, you cannot hire as many people as you, as you need to hire in order to grow. Um, and that's not what people expect from you as a startup, right? So um, someone joining us does not expect like the, I don't know, uh, 65, 70K um, salary as a junior engineer, for example, right? I mean, in some companies, you can actually expect that. Um, probably not most companies, but in corporate companies, you can expect that. But at the same time, what we can do or what we are um, um, often offering is um, participation in the business itself, right? So at some point, not for all new hires, but at some point we can offer um, actual uh, virtual shares that we can give out in order to participate in the overall business success, right? That's something you cannot really get in a corporate or mostly not get in a corporate. Or if you can get it, then it's not attractive usually because... For example, working at Daimler, you probably don't want to have part of your salary in Daimler stocks because they just lose value, right? Um, and for a startup, this is a different case. I mean, um, we are uh, we can provide that. We can, of course, also provide just with the job activity uh, in its own. I mean, we are super flexible. Um, you can try out a lot of stuff um, as soon as you are out of the MVP phase and in the phase that we are um, at the moment we can start trying out stuff, right? Like, for example, we try out new technologies for, for certain apps we need. Um, we tried out Flutter, for example, which is a rather new beta stage framework, uh, mostly. Um, and one of our engineers wanted to try it out um, just for his personal um, experience, but then he could combine it with actually working on a professional product that is then actually used by, by our customers, right? So really offering a job that um, gives responsibility and that gives um, ownership to to people I think that's like the biggest strength of a startup and also of us um, that we that you can provide in order to keep people motivated and um, also feel associated with the product in the end right I mean especially in the engineering team I mean all of our engineers have full access to all production systems <laughs> like Fabien um, is currently working as a backend engineer, um, uh, interning as a backend engineer, right? But uh, in theory, you have full access to uh, to all systems. So this responsibility and this ownership, I mean, I hope it's not uh, not misused at some point, but um, you just can, it's just not as restricted as in a, as in a corporate, right? So um, you cannot, you are not as replaceable as well as in a corporate. Like everyone in our team, every one of our 50 employees is contributing an essential part to our business. You don't have like this 80-20 effect where 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work. It's just, you cannot do that in a startup. And um, isn't that in the end what you want to do, right? Like you want to, to feel appreciated, you want to have ownership and you also want to grow, right? And that's another big thing that we can offer or that you can offer as a startup when you're growing, which is, you um, can just uh, take over responsibility also in terms of management responsibility at some point, right? I mean, someone joining as, a, as an engineer today, in like one year, we will have five new engineers and we need a team lead for those engineers. You can be the team lead for those engineers, right? So um, even though you don't have a lot of experience because no one has a lot of experience in our, in our company, we're just trying to be as data-driven as possible, as ambitious as possible, and as um, hardworking as possible, right? That's really an environment where I think you can not only from a technical perspective or from a from a knowledge perspective grow, but also from a personal perspective, right? I mean, I could never imagine when we started that that um, there's like a team of ten people that I need to manage now, right? And I don't know if I do if I'm doing it well, but um, I just have to do it, right? And you're thrown right into the storm. You just swim or die. That's basically it, right? And it sounds hard, but this is really what makes you grow. So that we can offer basically every employee. All right. Um, there are some more questions. Um, the first one is, uh, what changes did the website go through after your venture capital? And in what, uh, what did you invest into with the money? Um, actually, more like uh, the changes on the website, I mean, that's correlates a little bit, I think, because what we invested in with the money was... Um, basically only um, hiring people right in the beginning we don't mm -hmm. need any money to buy cars we don't need any money to uh, to buy real estate or whatever parking for the car 
nothing like that. We could fully invest it in HR and maybe a little part of it in software, right? Like we bought, for example, Salesforce as a customer relationship management system, which is like 100,000 euros or so. <laughs> it's super expensive. Um, and um, we invested basically everything in, in people. Um, and a lot of that was also just burned, right? Like misinvested because the thing is you don't know what to do, like how to do certain stuff in the beginning. If this is not your second or your third or your fourth startup that you're having, you don't know shit about anything. Like you don't know about which um, HR system you want to use, right? Just a system that manages the birthdays and the data of all and the contracts of all your, your people. Like I didn't know of any system, even from my corporate past, like when I was working with corporates, I didn't know exactly what systems they were using, right? Everything was like hidden under, under their own uh, UI there. So you don't know shit there. So you have to talk to people, you have to invest a lot of money, you have to just try out at some point. And that's where a lot of money went into um, we also hired many, many people in, um, not only in product development, but also in sales, right? Sales team is really essential for, for us, um, because they are bringing in the supply. Um, and then also on the other hand, selling the supply. Um, but, um, yeah, it was mostly people actually, and by investing in people or by investing in good engineers and uh, good product developers, um, of course, the website then also went through very, very serious cosmetical changes, right? Like, um, I think it was like three months after we got the investment, we uh, were launching then our new um, user interface for auctions, right? Which was, was then already optimized towards mobile usage um, and, uh, yeah, was having new features. So, I mean, the the... On the surface, for example, maybe it wasn't too many changes, actually. I mean, we wanted to look a little more professional. If you check out our landing page, for example, current CDE, it now looks way more professional than what we had in the beginning, which was just a WordPress template, right? Which was doing the job, but at some point, you just need to appear a little more serious, right? Um, and then you do um, surface changes or, or UI changes. But on the other hand, if something works, then like you shouldn't change it, right? So... We actually took some time or we, we waited some time until we actually uh, changed major parts of the applications on the surface because if it works, you shouldn't change it, right? Just because you have money doesn't mean you need to um, put everything in Chrome uh, at once, so. Okay. Um, how difficult was it for yourself as a startup to find the right employee, employees and where were problems uh, from what from which you learned something? This is probably the most challenging thing that you uh, have to do, um, hiring people, because at some point you're just not coding anymore, right? And you're not really in the low-level stuff anymore. Right now I am, but just because I want to be in that low-level stuff and just because I, we still have the need, right? Because we don't really have all the people we need in order to just work as a team. Um, so basically all the founders or all the management team, we are working very, very low level stuff. And if it's just a call you have to take with a customer that is annoyed, you do it right. Like even I'm calling sometimes with customers, um, and hiring the right people is, uh, I think the only thing you do at some point in time, then if you look, for example, at, um, Daniel Kraus from Flixbus, he's like the, the Flixbus CIO. And we are quite close to, to the Flixbus uh, founders. Like they are also like in a mentor relationship with us. And this guy, if you look at this guy, I mean, probably many of you know him from, uh, from Zollhof. I think he's like um, uh, many, many times he, he has been to Zollhof and just talked about Flixbus and the vision and basically what, um, yeah, what, what they are doing and what their product is doing, right? And always talking about the vision and always selling this vision and selling the company, right? And this guy is only doing um, hiring, so to say. Uh, um, because what he's doing is he's constantly selling the vision. So he's selling the brand of Flixbus, right? Even the, the employer brand of Flixbus. And um, at the same point, of course, he has recruiters. He has um, people who are then actually doing a technical assessment, um, which is a, like, like very lux luxurious for him because he doesn't have to do the technical assessment, which is also pretty hard. And also this cultural assessment, um, which is also super hard, right? But he's basically just filling up the funnel with potential hires. And then this whole hiring machine that they built after that, they are hiring the people then. But in our stage at the moment, in 
most startups that are not size of Flixbus, which is basically every startup, um, you have to do all of that on your own, right? And that's super hard. Technical assessment alone, if you're like, if you didn't even get your master's de master degree, um, it's not easy. <laughs> um, so you talk to people that have like 10 years more experience than you and you need to challenge them, right? And in some interviews, I'm challenged back and I cannot answer anything to whatever they, they are asking me, right? So um, this is like kind of a bootstrapping process, right? Like you have less, but you want to, to get to the next step. So you just have to, I don't know, um, apply some magic to, to, uh, to go the path to like the next stage then. It's, it's just it's recruiting in general. This is the only thing that will um, forever, I think, remain a black box for any company. Like you just cannot, even with the most sophisticated assessment center at BCG or McKinsey or whatever, you just cannot 100% say that this, whatever man or woman you're hiring is, um, is the right hire for your company. And that's, yeah. It's also a key learning, not a technical key learning, but um, that's hard everywhere. So uh, do you have any recommendations for students uh, for what or how they should prepare for the time after university as a developer? And in, in, uh, from another perspective, um, is there anything you wish that you know already when you started Count Sales? That you now know? Um, I mean, maybe uh, the, the last question first. Like, okay. Um, I wished I knew that, like, basically my whole private life will be gone after, <laughs> after six months into the project, and everything will turn around. That right? I mean, it wasn't like a really voluntary decision to drop out of the master um, and out of the PhD. I was already enrolled in the PhD program, right? So I dropped out of everything there. I um, was basically leaving Nuremberg where I wanted to stay for a longer period of time, right? When I came back from the US, I just wanted to settle down in Nuremberg, but it was just not possible with the company because the company determines everything in your life. Like you don't have a choice really anymore, right? If there are like three other people which are doing this, having the same commitment, you don't want to be the one who's dropping out at some point, right? And um, if you just work through weekends work through like 16 17 hours a day you cannot really do anything else anymore and if i would have known that before i probably would have given it a second thought <laughs> but um i probably would have still would still have done it but um uh, yeah maybe i would have pushed for virtual teams just like now in corona times a little earlier than uh, i could have spent a little more time in nuremberg with uh, friends and family because in berlin here we're just being in the office you just cannot get out and make any friends here, right? Your friends are the people working in the company. So you better hire well in order to have cool people around you. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's something I, I, would, uh, I would have loved to uh, have known earlier. But yeah, um, and tips for, um, for people like students um, wanting to go in development, I mean, I hope that everyone who's doing that is having already having during their studies um, was having like some type of a project or hobby or like a hobby project that they were working on um, engineering wise, right? Like practicing their skills in, in, um, in the real world, so to say, and not only in, um, in university, because I think that's like not getting you anywhere really in practice because whatever you learn, like even if it's like a super applied course at the, Real professor, where you do like very applied courses, and I really appreciate that. But still, it's not not very practical, right? So already during the um, the study program, I would really suggest to to do internships, like as many as you can, basically. Um, working as a working student, if there's like an engineering position, I mean, it's it's rather rare, but um, you can get some at, uh, I think Dativ is, is hiring some, some uh, engineering working students, for example. Um, and then also startups, right? Uh, or just side projects that you do where you really dive into the practical world of, of uh, development and software engineering. I think that's like the best thing you can have on your, on your resume, um, just to have, to show that you, can have passion for something and that you can um, focus on a topic and really uh, spend even your spare time on a, on a 
topic and diving into a technology or so just building a very simple product that is not that is maybe even out there already but still you have a reference and um, from what i know now from sitting on the other side right like reviewing reviews reviewing resumes uh, it's always nice when you open up a, re a resume and then the resume has to look a little uh, nice that's like the bottom line but then if you have a link for any product that you can for any whatever web app that you can click on and you can check out firsthand whatever um that this person built right this is like the best uh, application you can have basically so we're not really looking for any academic um uh, academic qualification here like I think I never checked really if someone finished their their study program really. I mean, I check sometimes the university they went to or like at least the country where the university is, and um, just yeah, try to find out what the what the courses or what the content of the courses was, and um, because a theoretical foundation of knowledge, like especially in computer science, that definitely makes sense. But more important than that, um, and I mean, I was never good in the theoretical foundations of computer science, but what I was always good in was um, basically throwing myself into this practical development and just testing out new technologies, um, testing out uh, new frameworks, just reading through through stuff, reading through um, through articles, dealing with, okay, which framework is better and for what reason. Like this very, very much practical um, knowledge that uh, is everything that you need in probably in the position that you work for, uh, work in in the end, right? So, I mean, most people um, studying computer science, studying information systems, probably not information systems, but computer science at least, they will end up as a software engineer. It's just like, it's always like the saying that you definitely get a job if you're in, in computer science or if you do anything related to computer science or informatic. But um, in the end, most people will end up as software engineers, right? And um, yeah, if you then already have a passion for that and if you have... Uh, the knowledge for that then you are the better candidate right in this in this um in this case so yeah there's like a variety of things i can recommend but internships and side projects i think those are very cool okay uh that's a last question and that's it uh what kind of abuse did you experience on your platform and how did you deal with it actually good question um since this market is so shady um the uh we already had a lot of fraud um actually not in the beginning but like somewhat actually a few months ago i think that the last case was there so that people are registering as uh, sellers and um in the beginning it was just possible you just entered your your bank account number right when you registered and that's where the money went to um in the end um, so people registered under false names, under false um, seller names, so to say, with like very um, established uh, dealerships, but they just entered their own uh, bank account number at one point. And then they could pretend to be another dealership and pretend to have like high quality cars when in reality it was just shitty cars. So uh, yeah, that was, I think, the, the biggest abuse in terms of money that was um, was concerned right because it was like almost i think like 60 70 thousand euros or so that were falsely um i mean there was still a car that was sold but still the car was not um it, it was still fraud right it's still like a like a felony even um, i mean we called police but it's never easy to find someone then right he's when he's using like multiple vpns and multiple um means of hiding the identity then you just cannot do anything here but um, what we did um, in order to prevent that is we um, not, that was not the only, re only reason why we introduced our own payment system, but this was one reason. And we introduced like this COS pay, this cost pay, which you can also see here, right? Which is like our very own um, payment system for these huge sums that we are um, transferring between buyers and sellers, which means uh, it's still done in a SEPA transaction, like in a normal bank transfer but it's fully automatically processed through our own system. And we also integrating a, um, a know your customer check, right? Which requires a customer, which is receiving money, which is the seller in this case, um, to identify himself with providing ID documents, providing business registration, etc. So um, yeah, that's helping with the fraud cases. 
However, yeah, we still have some buyers, for example, that are also registering as sellers and then inserting cars and are bidding on their own cars. We actually had some buyers that accidentally purchased their own cars, which, uh, yeah, we still charge them for the transaction fee, but they didn't make any money, right? And then they are pissed and like, there's a lot of uh, stuff that can go wrong, right? Um, we are such a physical business, like we're doing transportation, we're doing all these like very physical processes where so much can go wrong. Um, but actually, uh, we were lucky enough that, for example, none of our transporters lost a car mid on mid highway, right? Like uh, on the highway and no one got hurt so far. But uh, yeah, as soon as you scale up, you have to deal with that shit as well, right? In the beginning, it's just edge cases and like, you know, one in a million chance, but if you sell a million cars, then you will have this one, um, this one case. And then, uh, yeah, we uh, just have to grow with that and uh, handle all those cases. But yeah, fraud wise, I think we're on a good way. Okay, thank you. Um, that's it, I think. There are no more questions or does someone want to ask anything? Um, I guess not. Mm. Yeah, it's, it was a great talk and a great presentation. And thank you very much that you took your time for us and made uh, such a great presentation. Thank you, guys. Mm. Really appreciated it. And hope I will be back in Nuremberg soon. And um, if anyone comes to Berlin and uh, or will be in Berlin in the next time, probably not, but um, also in the next months, uh, then just shoot me a mail. Just add me on LinkedIn, shoot me a mail, um, an email in, in LinkedIn, and then I can show you the office. I mean, we already opened up again, but only for like 30% of the people working there. But uh, still, if you're interested in uh, how startups look like, especially how startups look like in Berlin, because here are many of them, uh, just connect. I think that's a good, nice offer. Uh, so, hmm. Okay, I think those were the Maximum. last questions and I think one hour of discussion and already one and a half hours of lecture before that. I think everybody got a lot of input and stuff to work through and think about maybe applying to you, right? <laughs> You're looking for them. Uh, so thank you for your great talk. It was nice seeing you again. Maybe, maybe see you in Berlin then. And would appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for the start and thank you for the time, guys. Thanks for everyone attending. Thank you for a great presentation. Okay, great last words then. I think. All right. Thank you and good night or good evening. <laughs> Quite some work to do still. So. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Then see you around in Nuremberg or in Berlin, hopefully. All right.